Hey guys, this is Caleb Marting, and I figured I should share an interesting discovery I made of 12 volt addressable RGBW chips. I'm going to be going a bit into the backstory and advantages and disadvantages of addressable RGB and RGBW, but you can go ahead and skip to the chapter what chips I'll be testing if you're only interested in that. If you've ever worked with addressable LEDs, you probably know about the WS2812B, as it's ubiquitous in the hobby space. I've worked with them extensively, so it was an obvious choice when I was developing my LED panel product. The success of these chips inspired many clones, some of which came with changes such as the introduction of RGBW, meaning there's an extra fourth color channel dedicated to a white LED, something that the original WS2812 line to this day does not have. RGBW is an extremely important feature for some projects, especially general lighting and professional applications, because the broad spectrum of white that a white LED produces can be much more pleasant to look at than the three color peaks of light from RGB. It can also reduce power usage, as you only need one LED for white instead of three. Something to know about these 5 volt addressable LEDs, however, is that they are severely hampered in performance by their voltage. Many of the products using these chips are JST SM3 connectors, which are technically only rated for 3 amps. If you check the standard strip length of 5 meters with 300 LEDs, they theoretically use about 10 amps, which will make the standard 22 gauge wires and connectors very angry. All this to say, I wanted a 12 volt single chip version of these addressable 5 volt chips. Thankfully, World Semi came out with the WS2815 chip, a 12 volt version. And for Open Source 2024, I was tasked with building 100 8 foot LED poles and decided to go all in on WS2815 chips because I could run many more poles off of one power supply. They worked flawlessly. Okay, the LEDs worked, but the poles had some issues, and I fell in love with this 12 volt version of my favorite addressable LED chip. During open source, I also launched my acoustic foam LED panels, link in the description, and they were using the WS2812B 5 volt chips, and our booth setup really highlighted the limits of 5 volts. We were running two 10 amp power supplies and very hot wires for each of our 32 panel walls. This helped convince me that we needed to upgrade to 12 volts, as general safety could be improved, among other reasons. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a 12 volt chip that had RGBW on it. Upon working on the 12 volt version, I saw World Semi's website and saw a page for WS2815B RGBW, but there really wasn't much information there. Doing more research, it was evident that this product did exist, but it was extremely new, and there isn't even an English version of the datasheet yet. So I figured I should do some testing and make a video as well to help get the word out. I was actually able to find these and a few other WS2815 chips for comparison in JLC PCB's SMT assembly library, not sponsored. So I designed a little prototype board and sent off my order. So here it is, my little prototype board. And on it there are three WS2815 variants and a little input buffer and supporting voltage regulator chip. I've chained the two RGB chip inputs together, but the RGBW must be separate because it sends four bytes instead of the three per LED. Please note that JLC PCB only had three WS2815 variants in stock at the time of making this video, so those are what I'm testing. I'm not a hardware engineer by trade, so please read the data sheets and come to your own conclusions if you end up using some of these chips. If you have more insight to add, please share a comment and I'll be sure to pin one containing useful info as well as update the description. First off, I have the WS2815B V1. These are your bog standard chips and the cheapest on assembled at JLC SMT at the time of writing. Next, the WS2815E, which is the economy version, even though it's more expensive per chip than the former. Finally, we have our special little baby, the WS2815B RGBW. And for the rest of the video, I'll be calling these the BV1, the E, and the RGBW respectively. Now on the topic of the physical chips themselves, the main difference is this big honkin' white phosphorus coating on the RGBW, and this is where the white LED lives. Now for some capacitors. WS2812s require a decoupling cap between 5 volts and ground near the LED itself. From what I can tell by the data sheets, the only one that shows a capacitor, even though it's probably not required, is the E, but that's between pin 1 and ground, and not positive voltage and ground. The WS2815B, not BV1 datasheet, shows typical application circuits both with and without this pin 1 cap, and no caps between 12 volt and ground. On the WS2815 strips I've purchased, not sure of the exact chip type, but they look like different chips than these three, there are no caps at all, so please make of that what you will. 
I'd love to hear some comments on what you think about not having bypass caps near the chips from voltage to ground. Also on these, you'll notice four wire JST plugs, but I only have JST three wire plugs here, so what gives? Well, the 2815 uses the same exact protocol for data as regular 2812 chips, and it's actually not a data and clock signal, just the data and backup data. This means that for the first chip in the chain, we can actually just ground the backup data and it will function perfectly all right with only the main data in. The only purpose of the backup is if the chip before it malfunctions, it can steal the data from the chip to in front, bypassing the faulty chip. On the topic of the pins of these chips though, you'll notice pin 1 is different on all three chips. On the E, it's connected to a capacitor. On BV1, it's not connected. And on the RGBW, it's actually a data out too. And I saw that data out too originally and was really confused by it. And the still in Chinese data sheet didn't help much or even make reference to a typical application circuit. I made the big assumption that it is supposed to be wired to the next chip's backup in. So I wired it through these cuttable pads, though I turned out to be right. In fact, it's actually just a direct connection between DN and data out too, which I'm assuming is supposed to make routing easier for some applications and make use of an unused pin from the BV1 variant. So what is the pin compatibility between these things then? Well, as it turns out, if you leave pin 1 floating without a cap, it appears like all of these chips are pin compatible, allowing you to make an RGB and RGBW version of your product with the same PCB. In fact, you could even have a cap on pin 1 if you use the E and just not populate it for the RGBW version. Now, this is the section of the video where you're going to have to trust me. I know it's hard. Since the quality of light really doesn't come across well on camera. I also have an ammeter directly hooked up to the LEDs, so the controller's power doesn't affect the reading. Check that out while I'm running my test to see the power draw, and make sure you also divide by the number of LEDs on to see the per chip power draw. To start, I'll just turn on the RGB LEDs for each chip, and to my eyes there is a slight difference in brightness between each chip, with RGBW surprisingly being the brightest, then BV1, and E being the dimmest. There's no real difference in color quality between them, but every channel at full brightness results in a noticeably bluish white. And this can be corrected by changing the values around a bit, or playing with the color temperature, but you will lose brightness and fidelity. Now I'll compare the RGB chips to the power of RGBW. I'm also going to disable the E for now, as it's the dimmest, more expensive than the B, at least at this point of writing, and also suggest an extra component. This will also allow for a 3 to 3 chip comparison for power usage. For WLED, which is the software I'm using to control the LEDs, you can control the white channel directly or let it auto-calculate based on the RGB value. Let's start with setting the channel manually. With the lights off, let's turn on the white channel. And as you can see, just the RGBW LEDs are on as expected. Now let's add in our RGB white. This makes the RGBW LEDs much brighter in person than the RGB, at the expense of about 9 milliamps for each RGBW chip. Switching to a rainbow reveals a problem though. The W channel stays on and completely overshadows the RGB channels in terms of brightness, which is actually very impressive. Nonetheless, let's turn on the white channel calculation, and there are a few modes to choose from, but I'll go over accurate, brighter, and dual. Starting with accurate, if you've ever watched a color loop of LEDs before, you know they can get a bit dim when making blue and purple. It seems like accurate helps keep the color at a more consistent brightness during some of those moments. Where this mode really shines though is pastels and brighter whites. This is a good all-around mode, but all white isn't as bright as it could be, because it won't mix RGB into a full white. If we switch to brighter, it's immediately apparent how much brighter the full white gets, at the expense of extra power draw. On a regular color loop, it doesn't change brightness much at all. However, with pastels, it makes the lighter colors much brighter. The only difference between dual and brighter mode is you get an extra little fun slider that lets you manually control the white channel if you still want to. But if it's set at zero, it will act like the previous brighter mode. I think I'll keep my RGBW chips in accurate mode as it looks just a little bit more pleasing to my eyes. In terms of power, the data sheet mentions voltage between 9.5 and 13.5 volts, and yeah, the white LED drops off starting at 9.5, but the RGB do still seem to work down to about 8 volts before losing brightness, although it all goes to hell after that. If low voltage performance is necessary, you may want to avoid the RGBW chips. As of recording on October 24th, 2024, here are the prices for those chips, and compared to a WS2812B. You'll also notice the severe lack of stock on the RGBW chips, so good luck. First come, first serve. If you're going to get these assembled by JLC PCB, please note that there are a few extras to consider. 
JLC recommends baking your chips to help prevent failures during soldering, and this does come with a cost. Also, you'll have to get the regular PCB assembly instead of economy, which also costs more, and requires rails along the side of your board that you either have to remove or they will, again, for an extra cost. Finally, each of these chips is an extended component, so even more cost. Yay! All this to say, these chips come at a cost assembled, but I think it's well worth your time to have the machines do it instead of you. So, all said and done, I'm still not quite sure the best design practices for these LEDs yet, and would love to hear your opinions in the comments. I'm definitely not an authority on these chips, but I can't find any information on these RGBW WS2815s, so someone had to get the ball rolling. Thanks for watching my video, and I hope you found it useful for using these chips in your projects too. Thank you!